Well, church family, grab your Bibles and turn this morning to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, and boy, are we going to go fast today because I've got, I have notes, I have a lot of notes, and I believe that the Lord has given me every one of these things that we need to talk about. Um, And I'm excited about that, church. I don't know if you know this or not. It's irrelevant to you. I guess I just want to say it because I'm excited about it. The Lord throughout the years from the beginning uh, taught me, um, instructed me that if God is real and if the Holy Spirit's true and if the Bible is his word, then I can go to it and trust him that the spirit of God would speak to my heart for what myself and his people need to know now that it's the same Holy Spirit that has always been, but I want him to speak now. And that being the case, my pattern of Bible study has always been uh, to go to the word of God with a blank sheet of paper, Bible open, pen in hand, and to glean what God has given me, to create the points, to look at the key words, to look at the, the section of what's being said in the context, and to let God develop upon my heart what he wants to say to the church today in the 21st century. And then when that's put together, then I go to the old greats, the, those that are predominantly dead, uh, preachers and ministers of the gospel throughout the centuries, and I make sure that my theology is sound and that I might glean any insights that I might have missed. And I love the fact that when God is in the preparation of a sermon, he gives it, in a way, to the teacher's heart that it's even better than what some great preacher gave to that generation. Why? Because it's relevant. It's not that that message wasn't great then, in 1863. It was. But the Holy Spirit is speaking today. And I hope that you approach the Word of God today expecting Him to speak to you in all power, because that's necessary for where we're going in the seven letters to the seven churches. We now come to the fifth church, church number five, Revelation chapter three, verses one through six. Follow along with me as I read. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, these things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but... You are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Verse three. Remember therefore how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled the garments, and they shall walk with me, says Jesus, in white, for they are worthy. Verse five, he goes on. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels, Verse six ends here. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Notice that it's plural, to the churches. Yes, it's Jesus' letter to the church at Sardis. Sardis was one church, a singular church, and we'll talk more about the background of it in a moment, but he ends in verse six by acknowledging that it's to the churches, So this is kind of cool to know. Out of the seven letters to the seven churches, we do know from church history that each church received its letter from the, uh, we'll say mailman, from, you know, the FedEx guy, literally postal runners. But once the letter was copied in that particular city, one of the seven, it was then distributed, and so all seven read all of the letters, not only addressed to themselves from Jesus, but also to the other churches. And that is wise, because the book of Revelation and these seven letters to the seven churches, the seven letters speak to seven era, or eras, or epochs of time, even up to this day, but it also speaks of certain historical moments in church history, but it also speaks about an individual heart, at any given time. So we need to remember that, it's very, very important. But listen, before we get into this, let's consider 
Sardis, what of it? What about it? I'm going to read to you. It's going to be kind of boring and sounding, but I'd rather have you be bored with the sound of this and get the facts rather than me miss something. Sardis, located in the region of then Asia Minor, or what is Turkey today, this ancient city of, uh, was host to the great merchants of the westward trade routes. It was in Sardis that the royal Persian trade route terminated. It was its most westward uh, point of the Persian route. It was and is naturally today even still a beautiful place. Its topography, I added this, looks very much like the ancient city Chino Hills. I'm joking right now. But the, the topography does, very hilly, uh, mountains in the distance, a lot of oak trees, a lot of olive trees, and very beautiful. Uh, and it had significant natural resources, chief of which being gold. Gold was so plentiful there that the river, or we would say a creek for us who live in the West, but they called it a river that flowed through the city center would perpetually deposit gold dust that would run down from the mountains and it would be on the bottom of the creek bed and along its shores plentiful. By the way, this is where coins were first minted in the ancient world. In fact, at about 560 BC to about 546 BC, Sardis was ruled by then king of Lydia, known as King Croesus, who was renowned for his great wealth until defeated by the Persians who made him or took him as a slave. By the way, King Croesus, you may have heard in school or in uh, ancient literature or reading that the saying came, Oh man, you're as rich as Croesus. He was known to be the richest man in the world in his day. He was the Jeff Bezos of his day. Just a billionaire, billionaire of his day. In fact, he funded a lot of chief things uh, in Sardis. By the way, have you ever heard the Midas touch? Have you ever heard of that? Oh, he's got the Midas touch. You know that saying was made to apply to King Croesus. That everything he touched turned to what? Gold. And so what's interesting about him establishing Sardis, what he did was, and you can see on the screen, he was responsible for building some key sites there in Sardis. By the way, the remains are there still to this day. For example, uh, Croesus funded personally the building of the temple of Sybil or uh, Artemis or what we know as Diana. It's all the same God going by different names. And I read to you again. It was King Croesus who had personally funded the construction of the temple of Artemis or Diana in Sardis, which when completed became one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Sardis was the center for the traffic of goods and ideas between Mesopotamia and the Greek Ionian world. And that's an awesome thing to think about. It is beautiful. It was now a, a, a part of the letter circuit number five. We're heading south now in this mail route. And it is this place beautifully situated. Again, it still is to this day. You guys, I don't know if you've ever been to Turkey, but Turkey is a beautiful country. It's, and you don't think of it as a Bible land. When you think of Bible lands or holy lands, yes, of course you think of Israel. But Bible lands, you're talking about Turkey and what is today Lebanon, of course, and Jordan and Egypt and Iraq and Iran. And uh, we don't think about that, the areas of the Adriatic and the Aegean, Italy. Think of it. Uh, all Bible lands in, in the scripture and in antiquity. And so it's important for us to note uh, that what is going on is that Sardis is this key Roman post of military strength had tremendous amounts of money. It was a place where ideas were exchanged. It was a hub. It was a central uh, place of operation. And it was very influential. And it was home, like many Roman cities, uh, home to uh, great temples, great worship centers of the ancient pagan world. Uh, but as we get into this, I want you to remember something. That the book, listen, the book of Revelation, as we're looking to the seven churches, the book of Revelation uh, is, is exactly that. It's not the book of Revelations, plural. It's the book of Revelation, singular. And you ask, Revelation of what? No, it's the Revelation of whom? The book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
You may already know that, but I want to remind you of some things. The book of Revelation is God's last word to mankind in the Bible. It's his last word about the nations. It's his last word about the church. It's his last word about Israel. It's his last word about you. And we're going to see that in today's study. By way of introduction, write these down, if you would, regarding who Jesus Christ is and why what he's writing is so important. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days, notice that, spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Notice the word there, worlds, cosmoses, it's hard to say it in English. It's cosmos, not singular. Cosmos is plural. Wow. The worlds that exist, who being the brightness of his glory and the expressed image of his person. Jesus is the expressed image of the person of the Godhead. Look, who uphold all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That's Jesus Christ. That's the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's who he is. Why is Jesus Christ the one who alone says this? Revelation chapter 1 verse 8. Revelation 1 8. Jesus said, I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord. Who is, who was, who is to come, the Almighty. That's Jesus. If you're struggling with the deity of Jesus Christ, go to Revelation 1.8, meditate on that, deal with it, cope with it, run head first into it because Jesus Christ is God revealed to mankind in human skin. He's the very revelation of God. Revelation 22, verse 12. Am I yelling? I think I'm yelling. I'm so excited about this. I'm excited about this message. So bear with me. Revelation twenty two twelve 12 says, And behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone to, uh, according to his works or his deeds. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. There's no one else but God who is that. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. 1 Timothy 2, 5 says, For there is one God and one mediator, one go-between, between God and man, that is the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. The revelation of Jesus Christ is the testimony of God regarding the deity of his son, and he gives it in due time. The word due time means at exactly the right time, which some of you Bible scholars and students are already thinking about, Galatians 4.4 4 and verse 5 which says, but when the fullness of time had come, think of that, at just the right time, at exactly the prescribed moment known to God, God sent forth his son, born of a virgin, virgin, born under the law, why? Verse five, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. No pun intended, but that's your due date. You and I being adopted into the family of God is all based upon God sending his son into the world at the right time in due time. And I pray this morning as we go through the study, you discover that you are in fact a born again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. You're not just attending a church. You're gonna hear strong words from Jesus about those who just attend church. Listen, to those who believe that they believe in Jesus Christ versus those who believe in Jesus Christ. There's a big difference. This is a critical study. In our note taking, jot it down. Remember the title, my dear Sardis, I've written to you a letter. And Jesus is saying, I've written to you to remind you that I know all things. According to the Bible, Jesus Christ knows all things because he is the second person of the Trinity, of the Godhead, all of the attributes that are ascribed to the Spirit, all the attributes ascribed to the Father, they in fact reside in all of the attributes of the Son. According to the Bible, Jesus Christ knows all things. Why? Because he is the second person of the divine trinity of God. He's God incarnate. 
He's God exposed to us in human flesh. He knows all things. And so with that challenge, look look at verse one. And to the angel of the church at Sardis write, these things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works or your deeds that you have a name. You've got a reputation that you're alive. Look at Jesus' assessment. But you are dead. Tremendous statement. This is stronger right now than any other rebuke or correction given to us in the previous four churches. Jesus hits them hard with truth. Well, the first thing that we realize is that he's announcing that he is the God of the seven spirits, the seven spirits of God. Now, church, I'm going to tell you right now, we do not know exactly what that means. We can speculate. Uh, If somebody tells you that they know exactly what it means, they do not know that. Nobody knows this. We can speculate, and when we speculate, we should be very careful. It's best to pull back and let the Bible interpret itself in such cases. For example, mark it down. Right now, next to your margins of your Bible, you should write these verses down for your own future study. When we talk about the seven spirits of God, what are we talking about? It's possible that we're talking about Revelation 5, verse 6, where the Bible says, John says, I looked and behold in the midst of the throne and in the four living creatures in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain. I'll give you one guess who that is. Having seven horns, seven horns, and seven eyes, really? Which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Okay, wow. Now we see that whatever he's talking about, that the seven spirits of God refers to Jesus Christ. We know that. And we know that it's speaking about not so much does the lamb have seven horns and lamb have seven eyes in front of his face. Now we're talking about horns in the Old Testament speaks about king, authority, or rule. It's another reference to a ruler, a king. That's why the book of Daniel talks about For example, ten horns or uh, seven horns in the book of Daniel. Then it always says that the horns are kings. When it talks about seven horns, we're talking about the absolute perfection of his politic, meaning he is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the totality and the perfection and the personification of all authority and rule. Seven. Also, you'd want to write down Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. Isaiah 11, verse 1 and 2 says, There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse. All my Jewish friends, listen. And I know I have some Jewish friends who watch this broadcast. Listen up. There shall come a rod. Go look that up in your Hebrew Bible. The word rod, capital R, is speaking about Messiah, the anointed one. From the stem of Jesse. So in the Old Testament, every Jew knows that the Messiah coming has to be a descendant of Jesse, the son of David, and a branch, look at that word, again reserved for the Messiah, shall grow out of his roots. Now look at verse two. The spirit of the Lord, number one, number one, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Look at number two, the spirit of wisdom. Look at number three. And understanding. Look at number four, the spirit of counsel. Look at number five, and might. Look at number six, the spirit of knowledge. Look at number seven, of the fear of the Lord. Absolute totality, absolute perfection. Jesus Christ is none other than the totality of God, and he knows all things. Thus, he's speaking to the church at Sardis, and he's reminding them, I know everything. I know everything about you right now. I know everything about your past and I know your future. And I'm coming to you as your authority and I'm coming to you because I know all things. Jesus is making that very clear. And then he says the seven stars, the seven stars of God. Where do you know the answer to this? In Revelation chapter one, verse 16 and verse 20, it says, he had in his right hand seven stars and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Remember what that is? The Bible, the word of God. So he's got the seven stars that he's holding in his right hand. The word of God comes out of his mouth and his countenance is like the sun shining in its strength. This is the description of Jesus. Verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars. 
because it was a mystery in chapter one, which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches. The word angels, don't think of flappy wings, heavenly angels. We're not talking angels. Don't think angels. These are the ones who are responsible for each church. Seven mentioned and seven churches. Each angel, the word is anglios, each messenger is responsible for the welfare of that church. By nature, Jesus is holding the seven stars, the seven pastors or messengers to each of those churches and he holds them responsible because he turns to them and he says, I'm talking to you and I need you to get this done and this and the other taken care of in your church. Strong words. By the way, remember this. We have lost, by the way, the concept. Of, we think pastors uh, have some higher rank or status in the community and we should have uh, whatever. Listen, you need to know something. Pastors are gonna have a very, very terrifying day on the day of judgment. God knows I'm only doing what I'm doing because I'm absolutely called by God to do this. I have no doubt. I do not need this career for my economy. I don't need this for my pay. I have been called to, I can do other things. But I'm with Jeremiah, woe unto me if I don't speak. And we need to remember that according to the Bible, pastors will be judged a much more stricter judgment in the day of judgment because of what they taught and who they created as disciples. It's a terrifying thing, to say the least. The seven stars are in fact these seven pastors and Jesus knows all of them and he knows everything about them. He says there, I know your works. And he says that you have a name, circle the word name. The word name here, say, they say that we have a name and we are alive. The word name means a particular authority, reputation or place. It means to be noted for. Uh, it means to, um, to have a history. So, when it says name, he's not talking about Fred and Barney and Wilma and Betty. He's talking about a name, about a reputation. You have a reputation for being alive. That's what you guys say. Hey, in Sardis, what, what do you guys say about yourself? Oh, man, we're the church that lives. You need to think about that for a moment. We're the church that lives. If you ask the Sard <laughs> Sardinian, the Sardines today, if you ask them, Hey, what kind of church are you? We're alive, man. Can you imagine? They totally thought they were alive. They thought they were cranking it out. Man, we're the church. Jesus says, really? I think you're dead. We're guilty as humans of judging things according to appearance. Oh, man, did you hear that worship? That church is alive. You and I may think so, but does Jesus think so? Oh man, did you hear that message? Woo, I felt so good. That was so great. Wow, can't wait till next week. Oh, he made me laugh. Oh, he made me cry. So what? What does Jesus think about it? Was it biblically accurate? Or did it use verses to prop up a story? Did, it use, did the pastor use verses to get to his main point, which was some analogy about him and his picnic or his vacation? Or I don't know what. These are dangerous, dangerous moments that you and I are living in a time of compromise and Sardis had compromised with a wealthy world and it had become very, very comfortable. It was a church that was cool and accepted. Everybody wanted to go there. Anybody could go there. You could go there just as you are and stay just as you are. When you die, you'll be just like you are. Very religious, kind of titillated a little bit about how cool it was and so much love and it was so fun and it was so this, but never born again. Jesus is gonna get to this. That's what he's referring to about being dead. He knows. And the word dead here is a creepy word, necros. It's where we get the word necromancy, the dead. It means actually a dead body. It means a rotting, stinky corpse. Jesus says, I see everything. So imagine every church that you drive by, imagine every church you and I drive by, you and I see it, and what do we say? See, this is a, by the way, this place, this place that I'm speaking to you from, it's a, a, 
it got an award for being a very beautiful building in the city. It's very beautiful. But if it's dead, it's a very fancy, decked up, decked out coffin. Who wants to hang around a coffin? Nobody wants to hang around a coffin. This church is beautiful on the outside, but is it alive on the inside? Are the people alive on the inside? That's what matters. God is not going to, oh, those are nice date palm trees. Oh, nice orange trees. Oh, nice olive trees. My, that's a nice parking lot. Are you kidding me? And if he looks closer, he doesn't care about our bulletin. He doesn't care about the seats in here. He looks into the heart because he knows all things. He knows all things. In Luke chapter 8, verse 17, Luke 8, 17, the Bible says, for nothing is secret that will not be revealed, nor anything hidden that will not be known and come to light. That's when we stand before Christ, when he comes, every, all the facades are coming down. Look, for those of you who do not live near uh, this area of the world, we can go and visit Universal Studios and all of the props and all, we can, you can walk down the street or go into some city or some town. They've got New York, they've got some other place and you're walking, it looks just like it. And when you walk the tour and then you go behind, you go behind it and it's all fake. It's all a prop. There's a lot of churches today that are like a prop. They're just very good at what they do very organized, I'm not, talk, I'm not knocking an organization, but they're, it's just, just wonderful. And I'm not knocking it, but is it alive on the inside? Is the word of God free and loose to do and the full counsel of God free and loose to do as God pleases? Hebrews chapter four, verse 13. Hebrews 4, 13 says, and there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Every single non-believer stands before God in the end for judgment, before hell, and every believer stands before Christ Jesus before judgment prior to heaven, prior to entering into the glory. Think of that. Number two, mark it down if you would. My dear Sy uh, Sardis, I've written you a letter to remind you that I see all things. I not only know all things, I see all things. Verse two says, be watchful and strengthen of the things which remain that are ready to die. Very, very observant and convicting assessment by Jesus. The word watchful, you need to circle this. This is probably, it's, it's not the most important thing about this message, but it's right up there. Watchful. You gotta circle the word watchful. Listen to the words of Jesus. He's, he's, he's expecting every church and every Christian to be watchful. There's no excuse for this. And I'm gonna to submit to you today, it's a very difficult thing to stay watching. It's hard to keep watching. It's hard to stay at attention. A lot of people today are being distracted. My goodness, more now than ever. You can't be distracted and be watchful at the same time. The word watchful means this, to keep yourself awake. It means to literally or figuratively Keep yourself awake to be vigilant, alert, and in the state of watchfulness to stay awake when you want to sleep. Jack, I'm tired. Jesus hasn't come back yet. My, my wife left me. My husband left me. My kids left me. My parents left me. I'm so tired. Stand up. Take a deep breath. Wake up. Be watchful. Wake up yourself. Listen, I'm doing better, way better now, but at some time, many of you know, I went through about three and a half years of pretty severe insomnia. And I was talking to a friend of mine who is in US Special Forces. And I was asking him about staying awake and how do you cope with it? He goes, well, first of all, I wasn't you know, 60 years old. I was 24 years old. So that's a big difference, Jack. But also this. He said, uh, there were times when we were in such a critical situation that uh, to fall asleep would, would mean we would die. And we've been up for three days. Three days. I said, how'd you stay awake? He goes, listen, are you ready for this? I don't know if this is standard issue. I don't know if that's, this was his trick. But this special ops uh -uh soldier said, I had Tabasco in my, my backpack. 
you know, Tabasco, the hot sauce? He said, I'd put Tabasco in each eye. He says, it feels like your brain's on fire. That'll keep you awake. I couldn't believe it. What would you do to keep yourself awake at such a critical moment? When temptation is all over the way that it is, the fear of loss of income, loss of hope, the darkness of the hour, spiritual issues being debated and it looks like the church has been written off and kicked off to the side. Don't lose hope, don't lose heart, don't become weary. This is what we were taught to be ready for. Be watchful. The Christian church is to be watchful. And when a church is not watchful, it begins to die, according to Jesus. He says, strengthen. Strengthen those things. The word strengthen means to go all around. This is a great word. Watch. To go all around and prop up, strengthen up, shore up what is right in your life, what's good. Build up, strengthen. Because everybody, everything's crumbling, but wake up. Get to the things of your life that's good and strengthen them. What is it in your life that you're doing good, that you're doing right, that honors God? Strengthen your Bible reading. Strengthen your prayer time. Strengthen your witnessing. So, Jack, you always say that. You want to know why? It keeps you watchful and it keeps you in the mode of strengthening what God has given you as a believer. To, to lean back, to, to set back, to fold, a little folding of the hands, a little folding of the arms. The Bible warns us in the book of Proverbs and we fall asleep. We fall asleep. I remember uh, years ago getting hit in the head. And you say, well, that's what's wrong with you. <laughs> Jack, you got hit in the head. I got a concussion in football and I remember uh, going to the hospital and then uh, going home and I remember my parents being told by the emergency room doctor, he's got to stay awake. He can't let him fall asleep for so many hours. I don't know what it was. He cannot fall asleep. And I uh, remember that was, it was a painful time because you didn't understand what, what's going on. And um, to be aroused like that, to be uh, constantly prodded. So my mom and dad, hey, stay awake, stay awake. Get up, let's walk, move, do that. That's kind of like the job of a pastor. Come on, get up, move, breathe, breathe. Get your arms up, take in some air, let's go. Church, let's move. Come on, stay awake, stay awake, let's go. What happens when the pastor falls asleep? When the watchman that's on the wall falls asleep? The entire city is now compromised by one man sleeping at his post. And I fear that across America today, there are pastors that are standing in the pulpit, but they're asleep at their post. God is saying, wake up, strengthen what remains. And the word remain here is a, an amazing word. It means things that matter. Strengthen those things that matter. And this is also, listen, this is fascinating because the word usage that Jesus applies to all the seven churches, it's very, very, what's the word? Technicolor to Sardis. Very, very brilliantly seen by the dwellers are the sardines. Can I call them sardines that live there? I'm sure that's not what you call them, but it's, it works. Very colorful to them. Why? Because they knew their history. They knew their past. They knew it. It was in the books, but they had forgotten it. Before I tell you this, Tacitus, the great Roman historian, probably one of the greatest ever, Tacitus writes, and I'm quoting, in the same year, of 17 AD, 12 famous cities in the province of Asia were overwhelmed by an earthquake. Its occurrence at night increased the surprise and destruction. Listen to this. Open ground, the usual place for refuge on such occasions, afforded no escape because the earth parted and opened up and swallowed the fugitives. There are reports of mountains subsiding, of flat ground rising up high into the air, of fires bursting up and out among the debris. Sardis suffered worst and attracted most sympathy. That's from Tacitus Annals 2, 47. 
Earthquake shook Sardis, the ground opened up, the people running out of Sardis was swallowed up in the fissures of the earth that cracked open. And according to Tacitus reports, mountains crumbled and ground level rose. By the way, I'm not joking. In Southern California, there's been numerous earthquakes in the past where dust, you could see uh, dust rising off of our, you, we have great mountains very close to here, very high, and dust rose from those mountains as they sank six inches in one of the earthquakes. I don't know if it was Silmar or Northridge, but the mountains sank six inches from their sheer weight during the shaking. Remarkable. Jesus says, you are ready to die. That, they remembered the earthquake that came in the middle of the night and got them. A church ready to die. What do you do with things that are ready to die? You pull the plug or you get it resuscitated somehow. A lot of churches die. Some of them should die, to be quite honest with you. They're not founded on the word. They're not praying. They're not witnessing. They should die. I learned from my pastor years ago. If, 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 God, if something is dying, let it die. Don't prop up. <laughs> Look, if your friend dies, bury him. Don't drive around town with him because you're going to miss your friend. He's dead. If something's dying, let it die. If it's time for it to go, let it go. There's a lot of churches in Asia Minor. Jesus only spoke to seven of them. There's other churches there. Colossi's one of them. The church in Hierapolis was another. What became of them? Listen, when a church begins to die, please write this down. When a church begins to die, it dies the same way a nation dies. It dies the same way a company dies. It dies the same way a family dies. It dies the same way a marriage dies. It dies the same way faith dies. Listen to this. A church dies... Only after it goes through this cycle, and this is true for business. A work is started with a man. Then it goes into a movement. Then because of success, it has a method. Writes books, this is how we did it, you can do it too. Then it becomes a monument. This is the place where this lesson so happened. And then it becomes a memorial. Do you remember that church? It used to be so powerful. Do you remember that church? It used to be so effective. Do you remember that church? What about the Christian? Do you remember that Christian that used to be so influential? What about the love and what about this? Oh, and you know what? They used to be a man of God. They got into the movement. God used them. And then they got into the stride and they were just trekking along. And then they woke up to the fact that they'd become a monument. Just something that it was talked about the past and then it's memorialized. You memorialize dead things in a dying church is a very, very easy thing to have happen because it happens to all things unless, unless they're resurrected. A dying or dead church is very, listen, self-centered. You judge your church where you attend and, and put yourself in there, by the way. I have to put myself in here, by the way. How do you know a church is dying? It's self-centered. In other words, they're very proud about themselves. They're an amazing church. They can't understand why anybody else would go to some other church when they're the church. I've heard pastors talk like that. I can't believe they don't go to our church. Have you ever been on a Friday night out and decide to eat dinner? Have you noticed that Burger King is packed? in and out Burger is packed? The Habit is packed? Colonel Sanders is packed? The pizza parlor is packed? People have different diets. Not everyone's going to come to your church. Okay? They're not supposed to. The word of God goes out in different venues to different people to hear the word of God. The church is not one geographical location. But the church becomes impressed with itself. It gets self-centered. It gets impressed with itself. As I said, it gets self-content. Uh, yeah, we'll meet with you. We'll tell you how we did it. We'll tell you how to do it. That's a scary thing. And then it becomes self-promoting. That's one of the last throws of a dying church. 
Spend more money on advertising. Spend more, more money to get out the name. We've got to get the name propped up. We've got to get fluorescent green lettering. We've got to get bigger lighting. Uh, get our name higher up on the building. No, that's wrong. It's wrong. That's when the flesh takes over. We are to be watchful. We're to be strengthening. And we're, we are to be careful. Look to remember, for I have not found your works perfect or complete before God. He says, remember those. Remember, therefore, how you have received. Wow, the word how. Remember, therefore, how you received. Not what you received. It's amazing. This means, are you listening? Are you guys with me? It means that they knew the truth. They received it. They had forgotten how they received it. It means this. Do you remember when you were absolutely terrified and lost and 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 shaking because of your sin-filled condition? Yes. Do you remember how the word of God came to you and rescued you? Yes. And do you remember the peace and the change that came into your life? Yes. Good. Keep remembering that. And I got to tell you, I am, listen, I'm telling you right now, please hear this right. I text some of our staff members studying this and I said, I'm so convicted right now. And I want you to listen because maybe this describes a part of you. I wrote it to myself. I wrote this note to myself when it said, remember, the key is remembering what God had done in the past. So I wrote to myself, I'm almost speechless regarding this. My life has been spoiled by the goodness of God. From the day I got saved, my Christian experience, yes, it was up and down and difficult and hard and I thought, I'm saved one day and not the next, and I, how can I, yes, all that dynamic, just like you, all of that dynamic, but my Christian experience has been more than two lifetimes for me. From evangelist Greg Laurie having preached the gospel of Christ to me and getting saved, to immediately going under the teaching of Pastor Chuck Smith who raised me up in the doctrines of God. By the way, in the midst of all that, Having, get, having gotten saved and going to Bible study under Pastor Chuck Smith, God brought my wife to me, who's been a helpmate and a guide and a great supporter for the last 41 years of marriage. And from the men who discipled me and loved me, who I got to know by name, first name basis, Dr. David Hawking, Chuck Missler, Tim LaHaye, Dr. Ed Heinsohn, Dr. John Wolverid, and the people, the people that I've met and the places that I've gone, the ministries that have come out from the work here, all around the world. And I wrote to myself, my heart sings over these things that God has done. Great is thy faithfulness, O God. Woe unto me if I forget the things that God has done in my life. And what about you? You want to, listen, you want to arouse yourself to being awake? Go back. Stop, stop, and get out a pen and a piece of paper and start writing. This is what I have to do. I've got to start going back and writing down the last 45 years as a Christian and what things God has done in my life. I could write a, a book to myself. See, the last thing you want to be is a pew potato or a clock watcher. There's always, I see them, not now, we don't have people in here anymore, but always at every service, there's people. If I go past 30 minutes, which is, I've never gone under 30 minutes, but people who are new, they'll go like this. They'll just go like this. And sometimes they'll go like this and they make sure I see it, which doesn't go over well. Now, you know, we want 30 minute church and we want two hours at the theater. Give me 30 minute church. And give me all day at Disneyland. Give me 30 minute church. And let's do this instead. No. That's the sound. That's the action of a dead person. That's the way of the dead. God loves his church. Look at verse three. And he says to, and heard what you've heard. Hold fast, repent, repent. Therefore, watch this. If you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief. And you will not know what hour I will come upon you. Why did Jesus say that? Because listen, number one, watch. Number one, the earthquake. 
that they never forgot, but they became complacent about, came in the middle of the night and took their life. That was their history. Oh, and two other major events. See, Sardis, the root of Sardis means the impregnable. Sardis means we cannot be invaded. The situation, listen, here's the city of Sardis and then the Acropolis there that goes up is where the great palace and temple was at. Croesus, when he was attacked by the Persians, went up to the top. They all went to the top. Nobody could get there. So watch this. Two different invasions, hundreds of years apart. Watch this. One was Cyrus, in your Bible, Cyrus came, the Cyrus in your Bible, he came, and he, he, couldn't, he couldn't defeat it, but they surrounded it. And there were days upon days upon weeks, the Persians were there, and they're wondering, how do we get up there? We can't even get up there. And then watch this. You guys, listen. This, remember now, Jesus said, watch it, I'll come like a thief in the night. One of the Persian regulars, a soldier, one day was with his battalion, and they're sitting there, and he's watching soldiers up on the peak, 1,500 feet up. And he looks, and the soldier took off his helmet on the top, and he was doing, doing something, knocked his helmet off, and it went tumbling down the side of the cliff. And the soldier thought, that's funny. Guy just lost his helmet. And an hour later, the soldier noticed that a man, a soldier that, who owned that helmet, came out from behind a rock down at the bottom, grabbed his helmet, and disappeared. And as he disappeared, that Persian soldier could see ever so faintly a little pop of his helmet in his head as he went back up. And it was discovered how to break in. And when they, when they went to sleep that night, the Persian army under Cyrus came in and took Sardis in the night, in the middle of the night, like a thief. And the same thing happened with Antiochus III when he invaded with the Assyrian army. Same thing. Found a secret place, went in, and captured them in the middle of the night. The impregnable. You say, Jack, don't get so excited. What's the big deal? I'm telling you now why it's a big deal. Here it comes. It's remarkable. Sardis had a saying. Because of its history and because of the earthquake, that nighttime is when we've been captured and nighttime is when we've died. They had a saying there, and I'm quoting it now. Sardis, they would say, remember, like a thief in the night. It's a reference to the earthquake and it's a reference to its ancient past. We were invaded in the middle of the night and we were captured like a thief in the night coming in. So what does Jesus do? I'm going to come upon you like the earthquake. I'm going to come upon you like a thief in the night. Because you're not ready. You're not watching. You didn't strengthen the things. I'm telling you now, you better do it. Man, I hope you're getting a lot out of this. I am. I'm very excited about this. It's just bringing the Bible together in so many places for me. It's exciting. Romans chapter 13, verse 11. I'm going to fly now. I was, I've been taking my time. Let's go. Romans 13, 11. And do this, knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us walk properly as in the day and not in the revelry and drunkenness and lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. Verse 14, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision or opportunity for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Wake up. Jesus himself was under that same sense of urgency. In John chapter 9, verse 4, Jesus said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is soon coming when no man can work. What a tremendous statement. Luke chapter 12, verse 35. Luke 12, 35. Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. And you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, that he may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you, he will uh, gird himself and sit down with them and eat 
and will come and serve them. Verse 38. And if he should come in the second watch or come in the third watch, that is of the night, and find them so, that is watching and ready, blessed are those servants. But know this that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Verse 40, therefore you also be ready for the son of man is coming in an hour that you don't expect. He said, Jack, that's, isn't that a little contradictory? That we're, we're to watch and be ready, but we don't know the hour that he's coming? That's not contradictory at all. That is absolute biblical New Testament Christianity right now. You and I are to be living, and this is the, the whole thing, you and I are to be living at a time right now, constantly ready to meet Jesus, serving Christ, loving on Christ, being obedient to Christ. Why? Because he could come at any moment. Yeah, but what if he doesn't? You are to be ready. You are not to be thinking, what if he doesn't? The Bible says that you and I are to live our lives, listen, occupying till he comes. That means being ready to meet him right now, but at the same time, willing and able to keep doing what we're doing Every day, every week, every month, year in, year out, until we see him. This is remarkable. So clear in scripture. Luke 12, 45. But if that servant says in his heart, I know people like this. My servant is delaying his coming. And begins to beat the male and female servants. Sloppy walk. He believes in Jesus, but he doesn't believe that Jesus could come back at any moment. So look what happens. He gets carnal. He gets sloppy. And he begins to eat and drink and be drunk. He's thinking, Jesus can't come back now. And the master of that servant will come upon a day when he's not looking for him and an hour in which he's not aware and will cut him in two and appoint him with a portion with the unbelievers. You say, Jack, did this guy lose his salvation? I don't believe he ever had it. He was just somebody who attended church. And I find it interesting, he was very critical of the imminent return of Jesus and his lifestyle proved it. 2 Peter 3, verse 3. 2 Peter 3, 3 tells us, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days. Isn't that great? Scoffers, laughers. <laughs> Jesus, what'd you say? Jesus is coming back? Oh, brother. Hey, guys, get a load of this. This guy says Jesus is coming back. Yeah, yeah. I used to go to church, or I used to go to church that taught that. Yeah, my grandmother said Jesus was coming back. Hey, the Bible says in the last days, there's going to be knuckleheads like that running around. They're all over the place right now, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers have fallen asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Peter says, of this, they are willfully ignorant. Wow. Wow. I gotta tell you, I don't wanna spend time on this. This is gonna sting. But this whole global quarantine, God's using it. And I'll tell you what, I think God has used it for many things, but one of them is the next chapter of church in the world is gonna be awesome. And you know why? Because this quarantine, people couldn't go to church. And there are people, listen, there are people tech, uh, emailing me and calling the church. When are you opening the doors? Hurry up. What's going on? Then there are people saying, oh, I like it better this way. And then there are people who's no communication with them at all. Listen to this. This has been a brilliant move of God. People who had a tradition of going to church like the sardines, when that routine was broken up, when the earthquake came, or when the virus rolled into town, and attacked, it caught them like a thief in the night. And they immediately got out, the, they went from one Sunday to no Sunday, no more church, and they like it. They won't be back. Because listen, it's God cleansing his church. They came here for routine. They came here for tradition. They didn't come here because they were starving to death for the word of God. They didn't come here because they wanted to love on other people. They came, they criticized maybe perhaps under their breath, the worship team, I don't like that song, the carpet's too dark, the seats are too hard, uh, Jack talks too long, or he doesn't wear a tie, or this or that, and the parking lot, and the other, and it happens to churches all around the world. 
They were of us. They were among us, I should say, but they were not of us. Remember that. Number three, I'm going to go even faster. Number three, he's reminding us that he can do all things. Verse four says, for you have a few names. Oh my goodness, a few in the church at Sardis who have not defiled their garments and they shall walk with me in white for they are worthy. By the way, the word worthy means they are, they are heavy. Uh, they've been weighed and they're heavy. It means there's content to them. It's a term used that answers to remember Croesus and his wealth. Do you remember Sardis being the first place where coins were minted? The coins of Sardis or, or uh, Croesus became acceptable in the entire Roman Empire because they were of such quality of gold. They were so heavy. That's what that word means. There are those who have walked with me and they're, they're, they're gonna get robes and they're gonna walk with me and they are so heavy. That is so quality. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. I'm not gonna belabor this, just the fact that Jesus Christ is the provider of our righteousness and he's done it all. Look at verse five though, church, before we end. We're almost done. He says, these guys, I will not blot out his name from the book of life. You say, oh, so my name can be blotted out of the book of life. I thought you said I couldn't lose my salvation, pastor. We're not talking, oh, calm down, slow down. Can you have your name blotted out of the book of life? The answer is absolutely yes. You better not. You better hope you don't. But according to the Bible, your name can be blotted out of the book of life. I know two Jews who prayed that prayer. One was Moses. Moses said, if you don't save these people, blot my name out of your book of life. And Paul the apostle. Paul said, God, if you don't save these people, blot my name out of your book of life. The only way that you can get your name blotted out of the book of life is if you fail at doing something that he has provided, that he's done for you. So listen, I'm gonna set you up for this. Revelation 21, verse 27 says, but there shall be no means those who enter in or anything that deviles or causes an abomination or a lie. Only those who are written in the, wait, what does it say? The Lamb's book of life. Oh, wait, wait, so which is it? It's both. There's the book of life that every human being that has ever been born has been written in the book of life. Every human. And then there's the names of those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Big difference. Big difference. Dependent upon the importance, listen, or value of an event. You want to ensure, right? Listen, you want to ensure your seat. It's called making reservations. If you're going to go to a big, a big deal, you make sure, and you even call them back, and you even make sure you get a confirmation number. If you're going to go to some big event, don't you do that in life? Don't you do it? Of course you do it. If you want to go to some swanky restaurant or some big event, you get your name on there, and you, you say, what's my confirmation number? Who, who am I speaking to? What is your name? And then you wait for those tickets to arrive, don't you? You've got to get your name from the book of life, copied over to the Lamb's book of life. Before we do that, I want you to hear this audio description of someone who, in real life, a real story, missed getting their name in the book. Ruthanna Metzger, a professional singer, tells a story that illustrates the importance of having our names written in the book. Several years ago, she was asked to sing at the wedding of a very wealthy man. According to the invitation, the reception would be held on the top two floors of Seattle's Columbia Tower, the Northwest's tallest skyscraper. She and her husband, Roy, were excited about attending. After the wedding, waiters in tuxedos offered luscious hors d'oeuvres and exotic beverages. 
the bride and groom approached a beautiful glass and brass staircase that led to the top floor. They announced the wedding feast was about to begin. Bride and groom ascended the stairs, followed by their guests. At the top of the stairs, a mater d with a bound book greeted the guests outside the doors. May I have your name, please? I am Ruth Anna Metzger, and this is my husband, Roy. He searched the M's. I'm not finding it. Would you spell it, please? Ruth Anna spelled her name slowly. After searching the book, the mater d looked up and said, I'm sorry, but your name isn't here. There must be some mistake, Ruth Anna replied. I'm the singer. I sang for this wedding. The gentleman answered, It doesn't matter who you are or what you did. Without your name in the book, you cannot attend the banquet. He motioned to a waiter and said, Show these people to the service elevator, please. The Metzgers followed the waiter past beautifully decorated tables laden with shrimp, whole smoked salmon, and magnificent carved ice sculptures. Adjacent to the banquet area, an orchestra was preparing to perform, all dressed in dazzling white tuxedos. The waiter led Ruth Anna and Roy to the service elevator, ushered them in, and pushed G for the parking garage. After locating their car and driving several miles in silence, Roy reached over and put his hand on Ruth Anna's arm. Sweetheart, what happened? When the invitation arrived, I was busy, Ruth Anna replied. I never bothered to RSVP. Besides, I was the singer. Surely I could go to the reception without returning the RSVP. Ruth Anna started to weep, not only because she had missed the most lavish banquet she'd ever been invited to, but because she had a small taste of what it will be like some day for people as they stand before Christ and find their names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Wow. True story. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 says, Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them, verse 12, and I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books, plural, were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which are written in the books. Revelation 20, verse 15. I'm going to leave you with a graphic in a moment, but this is our last verse of the day. Revelation 20, verse 15 says, And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The Bible tells us, in fact, I'm going to ask you to look at this uh, description or this display that's been put together for you. And we'll end with this. You need to make sure, understanding that what you're hearing right now from me, to know this, do not be willfully ignorant of this, that your name, whoever you might be right now, your name is found in the book of life right now. If you're hearing me, if you can hear my voice, your, book is, your name is written in the book of life. You have been given life. Now what you do with your name in that location is of eternal consequence. For you to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are then, listen, to believe in him, put your faith in him, and what happens, as it were, in my illustration to you right now, is we are going to, Dan, Danny in the illustration is going to accept the Lord. Look how this works. Danny accepts Christ, we hit copy, and we move off the book of life, and we go over to the Lamb's book of life, and we paste Danny's name right there. The moment your name is in the Lamb's book of life, it is impossible to get your name blotted out of the book of life. You need to remember that. If your name, at the moment of your death, has not been copied into the Lamb's book of life, that is those who are saved by the Lord Jesus Christ by coming to him in faith, repentance of their sins and trusting him, if you don't do that, your name is not only found missing in the Lamb's book of life, your name is erased out of the book of life. After the day of judgment, your name is removed. It's as though you are blotted out from the memory of man. But you yourself, according to the Bible, because of your rejection of the love of God 
and the salvation of God, you would never go to the Lamb. You would never go. You never got your name transferred. And you have forgotten that. And you want to make sure today, will you pray with me wherever you're at? Let's pray together and let's have your name go from the book of life, be copied and pasted in the Lamb's book of life so that you might be one of God's children forever. Heavenly Father, we come to you right now and Lord, maybe perhaps someone's confessing today that they have been in a church that's not only dead, they were just as dead as that church a church that is settled back on its history, a church that says, we remember when, a church that is open on Sunday and Sundays only, a church that has relegated itself to rituals and to routines and to traditions, but there's no dynamic, there's no unexplainable action, there's no great dependency, there's no uneasiness, there is no movement of your Holy Spirit. And they recognize that because they can attest to the fact that their church is just like they are now. But by your Holy Spirit, as you stir them up right now, maybe there's somebody out there that's listening and they're saying, you just described my church and my life. My dear friend, if that's you and you want to change, will you pray this? Lord Jesus Christ, come into my life and change me now. I have sinned against you. I have fallen asleep. I'm not excited about your coming. I'm not burdened for the lost. I rarely open up my Bible. I rarely think about you, God. And I'm convicted. And I'm asking you to change my life, Jesus. Wash me of my sins. Put your Holy Spirit in me and make me yours as I confess Christ as my crucified Savior and resurrected Lord. Thanks for watching the Real Life YouTube channel. We love bringing you content that will help you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. You can subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss one single video or live stream and you can share it with friends and family. If you'd like to support this ministry by helping us reach others, by taking the gospel and the teaching around the world, you can do so by clicking the Give Now button. So thanks again for watching, and God bless.